All right, so I just want to go into some more detail, really, then about about just the catastrophe that the Great Leap Forward was. So talk about some uh, in the area of in, of industrialization, the factories. Frank Dakota writes, "Quote above the hissing molten metal, the clang of crucibles and the whistling steam, an incessant racket would come from loudspeakers." spewing out propaganda and radio programs to encourage workers to increase production, end quote. I've read a few actual accounts from people that sort of survived it and in the 80s or 90s would sort of tell their story. And they said, yeah, it was sort of all day that they were pumping out sort of the propaganda while you worked. It's, uh, it is a bit like something out of uh, an Orwell story. <laughs> and I, I mean, I don't want to go down that road because a fair bit of it is quite Orwellian, but... Uh, yeah, sorry, what did you say? Well, I assume as well people were probably working like most days of the year, right, at this time? Uh, yeah, you didn't have days off. Yeah, Mal thought thought of every, every worker as a soldier and you didn't necessarily get days off. Yeah, if you, well, if you worked in the fields, you definitely didn't. We'll get on to that later. Uh, in the in the factories, there was, uh, well, uh, I heard described as a relentless maltreatment of people and, and the actual equipment. Well, there was a huge culture of waste just a huge culture of waste um if it was if whatever you were doing was charged to the state people didn't seem to care if they had an abundance they would just throw it away or just not care they would just break tools and just ask for a new one and if their gathering had too much food they just throw it away and yeah apparently the culture of waste is just huge and of course everything they manufactured was crappy (laughs) because it wasn't done right um, nearly everything that like it says, um, I think I said earlier, from soy sauce to hydroelectric dams. But um, apparently it was everything, you know, from needles to steel itself. And of course, the irony of the st- one of the ironies of the steel was that uh, they tried to use some in uh, one of their big projects in in Beijing on Tiananmen Square, and they, it didn't work. They had to the girders just weren't good enough, so they had to get them from outside. Medicine, even medicines were quite often just like poisonous or didn't work. It's crazy how it seemed to have permeated everything. It really does seem that way. And even their military things they made, you know, like tanks didn't work properly. A few aeroplanes they tried to make didn't really work. Boots that sort didn't of work. thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I've heard that, yeah, shoes and boots weren't stitched together properly. It was everything. Seems crazy, doesn't it? Like, where were the, there must be some people that, the tools and the machines for making other tools and machines Mm. machine tools yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah. there were loads of industrial diseases and chronic diseases loads you know ones you get like black lung from stuff and And I'm picturing like terrible pollution and stuff as well oh yeah yeah air pollution is one of the things that can never be measured but I mean China's known even in the modern era for having terrible air pollution well, Dakota sums it up really well, actually. Frank Dakota writes this, quote, When all the problems inherent in a planned economy were taken into account, uncontrolled capital spending, enormous wastage, defective products, transportation bottlenecks, woeful labour discipline, the performance of most factories was dismal. The actual costs were difficult to calculate in the financial morays created by central planning. Not only did accountants cook the books, but sometimes they did not even know how to handle the sums. End quote. Um, Because they would put sort of party officials, carders, in in charge of things as sort of almost autonomous rulers in their locality. And they weren't necessarily experts on anything. Because they see that, I assume that communists see it, that the the population without political direction is just sort of recalcitrant and not (laughs) not into the task, you know. And if only they were, if only they're they're inspired, stroked, stroked, whipped the right way and hard enough yeah. they will produce feats of incredible production and stuff. yeah well one way i've heard it described was that the communist leadership of china saw uh, human labor as something they owned that belonged to the state your labor all belonged to them so of course the state represents the working class yeah, <laughs> yeah. doesn't it just um, by 1961, the economy completely collapses, really. There's no coal apart from anything else. That one thing, it's one of those things when you pull that support away, loads of other things just grow into a halt. Most industry, really. Deliveries. So, yeah, the, their coal production, as well as nearly everything else. But that collapsed, so everything else just really ground to a halt for a while there in 1961, pretty much really grinding to a halt. <laughs> But no factories closed, even though they didn't do work for a while because they couldn't. No factories closed because that's not how it works. 
under socialism. It's uh, they have no boom and bust. Mm. It, it stays open because the state makes it stay open. Uh, people just don't get paid or whatever. That doesn't matter. So no factories closed in that period, which you know in a normal state of affairs they would be. But when it comes to trade, like intra-Chinese trade, that is. That's something the communists didn't want. I mean, that's capitalism, isn't it? Just people trading and bartering among themselves. You're not supposed to have any private property, so how could you ever trade? But it was never, uh, the profit motive was never stamped out. One of the ironies, really, that under communism, everyone is becomes a trader. Everyone's forced to become a trader, even though that's exactly what they don't Often want. Often in the black market. Yeah, in the black market f- for survival. Yeah, of course, yeah. I've heard it said about the Soviet economy that especially like later when it was less of a terror regime, it just came to rely upon black market trading, even in industry, like yeah. bribery and like, yeah, underhanded exchanges of like raw material. Yeah. And on massive scales sometimes. Yeah. 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 Just to get anything done and to avoid getting demoted or imprisoned or whatever. Yeah. Loads of state goods were uh, lost in inverted commas. Um, and just simply made their way onto a black market. I mean, loads, millions of tons of things uh, were, in inverted commas, lost. And by 1961 be- begins, anyway, sort of some markets open up um, and they're sort of begrudgingly allowed to happen <laughs> by the party because, well, because everything has really come to a complete halt, a real collapse. So they're sort of begrudgingly allowed in some places, like in Beijing and the big cities. Um, they can't not allow it. <laughs> yeah. Well, before the communists in 1949, before that, Chiang Kai-shek allowed department stores in the big cities, big department stores. They said had uh, flashing lights in the windows and had all sorts of weird and wonderful foreign products. But Mao and the communists smashed those up sort of straight away. Or, well, actually, not. They didn't smash them up straight away. They used them for a while and then sort of phased them out and used, like you know use them for something else eventually. But they they didn't exist by the Great Leap Forward by the time of the Great Leap Forward. But so something like a, an impromptu market opening up somewhere near a train station or something was sort of a godsend, a, a, a lifeline for quite a lot of people, I think. I've seen a couple of clips of things like that happening in North Korea now. Right. Even though right, it's like the yeah. most total terror yeah. state that we've known. Really. And people just want like a warm jacket and some soap and a bit of meat or something. That's all they want, <laughs> stuff like that. But it might be the difference between life and death. They did have what they called uh, friendship stores, which were just for party members, usually higher the party for members. Terror. And for sort of visiting foreigners, where they had, they were sort of show shops, you know, where they sort of had quite a lot of products and stuff. But normal people weren't even allowed in. Because uh, they were, by 1961, anyway, after sort of the Great Leap had done m- most of its worst damage, um, the, there was massive inflation, massive inflation on everyday goods. Just like I say, things like soap and like needles and things just had gone up just a silly amount. And of course, wages were sort of kind of non-existent. It was meant to be a coupon system. But um, the, uh, one of the things they did is that um, if you had anything, if you needed anything mended or repaired, the state would do it for you. And so in the big communes or in the big cities, there would be service stations. So were you banned from darning things at home? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you in the idea is that you wouldn't be able to because you didn't have any of the, the things you needed to darn your own clothes. You wouldn't mm. have... That's, maybe that's no private, private property. All right, okay. All right. So even um, that level of property was smashed. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, yeah. Uh, but these service stations were just massively inefficient and they didn't do it and you still had to pay them some money. And it got so stupid that it was more expensive to take something to one of these service stations uh, oh, than to buy a new thing. I can understand that. If there's one thing you can't allow... It's people darning stuff at home like that. <laughs> that does have to be in any good society. <laughs> that has to be eradicated one way or another. Yeah. <laughs> and Mao wanted to uh, create that. They there was a Tiananmen Square in in Beijing, but it wasn't as massive as it is today. I don't know if you know, but it's massive. Mm. It's like uh, I don't know. I think it's like the size of sixty football fields or something. Okay. It's, it's it's huge. And uh, what when Mao had gone to. Moscow a couple of times. It obviously um, picked up a few ideas. Well, is Red Square like, impressively large? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Frank Dakota writes, quote, Every dictator needs a square. 
Military parades are at the heart of state rituals in communist regimes. Power is evinced by a show of military might, with leaders gathering on the rostrum to meet the cadenced tread of thousands of marching soldiers and model workers, while jet fighters scream and whine overhead. Stalin had the resurrection gate on Red Square bulldozed and Kazan Cathedral demolished in order to make room for heavy tanks to clatter past Lenin's tomb. So Mao feels like he must outdo Moscow. He really does feel him in himself in direct rivalry with the leaders of the Soviet Union and with the Soviet Union in general. So, yeah, Tiananmen Square is bigger than Red Square. And it's around this time, even though the famine is still, you know, a reality, he orders 10 new big projects. And they're all things like, you know, a brand new Hall of the People on Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square made much more massive and regular and... uh, a massive new train station, a massive hotel, 10 new projects, and loads of the provincial leaders under him out in the provinces all sort of slavishly copied him and and dreamed up 10 massive projects they should do and put loads of people to doing it. And, you know, most of them were disasters and never got finished. In fact, it says there's loads of, um, loads of the bigger cities like Beijing and Shanghai in their suburbs and stuff. There were just loads of... Um, just the skeletons of half-started buildings where they bulldozed loads and loads of housing and then sort of half begun a story or two of the superstructure of a building and then just left it there and ended it there. And they were just sort of left there for years. Like that hotel in Pyongyang. Yeah, exactly, yeah, but not even anywhere as good as that. <laughs> uh, the, apparently, the, the party leadership did have actual plans to destroy the whole of Beijing. And have it entirely reworked. They did want, they did rip down a fair bit of the, what is it, the Vermilion Walls? Or the Crimson Walls? I think it's the Vermilion Walls. Part of the old sort of medieval ancient walls of Beijing. There's a, it's, there's a slogan or a line that's something like bricks belong to the people or something. <laughs> so you're at liberty to tear down anything you want, basically, with that one. Yeah, they planned and started to build skyscrapers whilst millions of people starved. Um, all big houses were ruined, obviously, because that's really high up on the communist list. It's just to steal the big houses um, and pretty much trash them. Pretty much simple as that, yeah. And some of the really big mansions in, in like Nanjing or Shanghai or Beijing were sort of taken over by state organs like the Air Force, but they were still just trashed. And in the end, like, all, all the toilets and the copper wiring and piping ripped out of the walls and stuff. The churches and temples and mosques were, uh, quite, a lot of them were destroyed or just taken over and used as other things. Big chunks of the Great Wall were just taken and used for new projects, which were never really finished. Was it um, an explicitly atheist regime? Technically, yeah. Yeah. In reality, it never really stamped out or never really, like, really, really pushed to stamp out religion. But technically, yeah. There's loads of... I mean, China's so massive and there are a few different cultures. They've got different religions. But uh, one of the ones is sort of ancestor worship. Or at the very least, um, revering the tombs or graves of your ancestors. But loads of uh, temples were sort of pulled down and even gravestones ripped up and used for stuff. And even bodies exhumed and crazily used as fertilizer or boiled down if they were fresh and then used as fertilizer and uh yeah it seems there was a trade in uh exhumed bodies to some degree well because of the paucity of resources mm. and uh also just to to take a dump on ancestor worship when uh, for some times okay. like there's some temples that are like ancient temples that were dedicated basically to a type of ancestor worship and they were you know sometimes Pull down. As I mentioned earlier, it really depends what region and, and what time. So this, none of these things are particularly uniform across all of China. But yeah, I mean, places, certainly. And, I mean, these huge projects and the, the rush to collectivise was, after like 1957 and 58, was really done through coercion in the countryside. And there was just huge homelessness. And quite often people found themselves just sleeping by roadsides. I mean, I'm talking about millions of people just huddling under somebody else's eaves. Who at um, least did have a home before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because if you knew uh, collectivization was coming, forced collectivization was coming, you were going to be forced to, to live on one of these giant communes and you were still just about at liberty to flee. Loads of people did. I mean, millions of people did. Right. And tried to escape that fate. Yeah, at not least. knowing what else lay in store for mm. them, but just right. 
I mean, millions of people were displaced, and uh, and sometimes you would find they would find loads of people crushed together in single buildings, many families having to share really small rooms. You know, you know, when you get told about a sort of 19th century or higher Victorian squalor, how terrible it was in Liverpool and London and stuff, and loads of families crushed together in single houses, is that sort of thing as bad as that or worse in some cases? The Great Leap Forward really, really screwed with the environment and the nature, the natural world in China. Mao said, there is a new war. We should open fire on nature. <laughs> Um, I'm glad you laughed because that is quite funny in a way. I mean, in a macabre sort of... Deranged. Yeah. Mao and, and the communists saw nature as um, just something to be overcome, just just simply a resource to be, you know, absolutely plundered. But actually yeah. opening fire on it as well, to take it yeah. down. <laughs> well, that plays into the thing where Mao saw the whole thing as a war, an extended battle. Yeah. So a, a, lots and lots of the of the slogans and sayings are, are are framed like that. Yeah, but he's referring to the natural world, the 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 ecosystem, the environment. It's saying it's open fire on the environment because it's holding us back from progress, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's I mean, just needed to it's just needed to be done to realise like, the paradise. I do sympathise. So you can't you can't build a just world. And tolerate nature. <laughs> <laughs> you can't let nature continue to laugh in your face. <laughs> doesn't doesn't nature care about poverty? <laughs> Nature's pretty bourgeois. Nature's yeah. a, a rightist uh, conservative. It's reactionary. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Mother nature is a revisionist. Nature is bigoted. <laughs> They absolutely decimated the forests, um, especially in the north. The south is uh, more tropical, subtropical. But the north, the further you go north, the less um, tree coverage there is. Um, and even in the imperial period, all throughout Chinese history, wood was relatively relatively rare um, in the north. And so when the Great Leap Forward came and they caned through all their fuel for as quickly as they possibly could in like 1958... They were then left with a real dearth of, of uh, timber. They were like trying to find just tiny scrapings for kindling and stuff. And all the way along, if they even dare, even if they do dare to tell their superiors, we haven't got any fuel, their superiors would be like, get it done. Get it done. Whatever, like, well, you whatever. might just be sent to a re education camp just, just for, for saying that. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So even if they did dare, but they probably didn't, and they were just like, well, we need some other kind of fuel. Mm. So whatever you can get. It's like a, a a vicious cycle of want, you know, because after you've got no fuel, you can't do other things. There was massive floods in 1959, actually, all through, un- unluckily, all through 1959, 60, and into 61, there was really bad weather. Like the, the winters were really cold. I think the winter from 58 to 59 was really cold as well. Yeah, they're a bit unlucky. There's quite a few hurricanes. I mean, it happens all the time. China's so massive. But, um, they, you know, they did have a few unlucky years of weather and it just made, everything worse. So when there was some big floods, particularly in the south in 59, all these crappy water conservancy projects they'd made, all these makeshift reservoirs and shoddily built dams just just broke and didn't work and the, the, inundated like, the land <laughs> and, yeah, ruined crops and things. And presumably loads of people died making those things. Well. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. That was all for nothing. Yeah. Uh, but even worse, um, some of these dams didn't, break straight away and, and become what is essentially a ticking time bomb. And many times over the next decades, they would just sort of suddenly collapse. I remember, I can't remember where I heard this or read this, but there was someone talking to a modern Chinese engineer or a guy that was old in the 90s, say. Um, and he said, I think he was talking in the 90s, and he said, yeah, we still haven't got rid of all the crap from that period. We're well, basically in, in translation something like, yeah, everything from that period was shit. <laughs> and we're still living with some of it. Yeah, and the, the land really, like I mentioned before, there was um, the soil salinization. It created what they call alkaline land, where the land's been inundated with not the right sort of water. And then it's just fucked for years and years. That happened loads. Yeah, rivers were polluted. All the um, industrial waste and they were making loads of industrial waste. They were making loads of pesticides for some reason. Loads of different types of pesticides. I'll get into that later. Uh, but then it all just got dumped straight into the rivers, poisoning like the w- very water tables in vast areas. Um, and of course that would poison people. 
if they're drinking using the wells that they'd always used in t- since time immemorial, they don't know that he may be a hundred miles away. Some uranium plant has just poisoned your well, and you don't even know. And you and ten villages around you will die. And it's crazy. And that doesn't even get in the news. It's like that's nothing. Frank Dakota writes, quote, Enthralled by the power of the masses to conquer nature, Mao had raised the call to eliminate rats, flies, mosquitoes and sparrows in 1958. Sparrows were targeted because they ate grain seeds, depriving the people of the fruits of their labour. In what is one of the most bizarre and ecologically damaging episodes of the Great Leap Forward, the country was mobilised in an all-out war against birds. Banging on drums clashing pots and beating gongs, a giant din was raised to keep the sparrows flying until they were so exhausted that they simply dropped from the sky. Eggs were broken and nestlings destroyed. The birds were also shot out of the air. Timing was of the essence, as the entire country was made to march in lockstep in the battle against the enemy, making sure the sparrows had nowhere to escape. End quote. Once again, you cannot have a decent world. You cannot have a socially just world if you do tolerate Sparrows. Yeah, I don't see how the means of production are supposed to pass to the proletariat in a world where sparrows are still breathing. Yeah. I don't, I don't, yeah, it doesn't follow to me. Um, as I, as I think about the, the unfairness of the world, my thoughts automatically turn to loading up a rifle and just taking down as many goddamn sparrows as I can from my window. Yeah, and I, I hear you. I, I hear you, comrade. I uh, I see uh, I see a capitalist in a shiny top hat inspecting his his production line, and all I want to do is throttle a sparrow. Yeah. That's all I can think or of. Loads of sparrows at once. Get them all in a bag and like, whacking them against the corner of a wall. Just screaming social justice as I do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is justice. Yeah. And and the numbers are um, as surreal as the campaign itself. They come up and they said after a year they said yeah we've killed. 1.6 million sparrows in the greater Beijing area or something and and we've killed x x kilograms worth of flies and things um <laughs> tonnage of, yeah tonnage of vermin and stuff. yeah but of course sparrow you need sparrows it's a really delicate ecosystem out there more or less a food web if you get rid of sparrows then loads of like locusts and grasshoppers suddenly go nuts yeah you get you get epidemics of those and it might take Decades to work itself out. Yeah, apparently sparrows didn't really return to China for years and years and years, in any numbers, anyway. They obviously didn't kill every single one, but... I wonder if mm. now they're, like, cherished. (laughs) (laughs) Doubt it. No, probably not. (laughs) Yeah, you need sparrows, because if they... they, And that's exactly what happened. Then they had had huge plagues of locusts and grasshoppers that, that, again, destroyed many crops, just adding to the many reasons why crops got destroyed or people weren't able to have their fill of food. Just because, well, I can only imagine someone said to Mao, or maybe Mao just saw one one time that sparrows were eating grain. That's it. That's as far as it went. He thought himself wise enough that he would just make decisions on a basis like that. Yeah. Well, they were superhumans, he thought. Not exactly, not in the like, Nietzschean or Nazi sense in any way, but he thought him and the leadership were... Again, not in any real way, but like gods among men, in a, mm. in a sense. Um, and of course mm. they knew best, yeah. Dakota says, quote, Mao lost his war against nature. The campaign backfired by breaking the delicate balance between humans and the environment, decimating human life as a result. End quote. I suppose some people will judge that on balance, Mao did more good than harm. Oh, no you don't. Not again. Sorry. <laughs> 